Okay. My name is Douglas Zellevel. I work at the University Medical Center in Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, my talk is Allometric Scaling in PKPD Model. What is allometry? What is allometric scaling? Allometric scaling is the study of body size to diverse biological characteristics. Uh, when you look at nature, and you look at different scales and different sizes in nature, patterns emerge which you might not initially notice. If you look at the elephant scale skeleton and the cat skeleton, one of the things that should, you should recognize is that the skeletons look differently. The uh, cat skeleton is the bones are thin, the aspect ratio is very high, and the elephant, the bones are very thick, and a greater percentage of the body weight of, uh, uh, of an elephant is uh, taken up by bone than for a cat. What are, what are these patterns? Why do they exist in nature? What are the rules govern, governing these patterns? This is what allometric scaling is about. Allometry uh, uh, has a fairly long history, uh, back in uh, 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 early 19th century and a little bit before, Otto Snell in 1892, Darcy Thompson in 1917, Huxley and Tessier, they, f they first coined the term allometry in 1936. So you get an idea about how long people have been studying this. And very often the, these, uh, uh, these uh, allometric equations are power law equations. Some character characteristic of interest, that might be clearance, that might be some kind of rate, that might be some other property of, a, of, uh, of some biological system, is uh, uh, equated in an equation, which is a k, a some, some k scaling factor. Uh, times x a size descriptor, uh, usually weight but not necessarily weight, and a is a scaling exponent. Now the interesting thing is what is the scaling exponent, and that depends on uh, what the characteristic of interest is. And you can see graphs from uh, very old publications from 1907. You can see you can recognize here power functions. Probably the most famous uh, power function or allometric scaling data set came from uh, Max Kleiber. Uh, in 1947, and he showed data supporting a uh, allometric scaling exponent of three quarters instead of uh, the for metabolic rate. Uh, uh, he found an allometric scaling exponent of three quarters instead of the, at that time, very widely accepted two thirds scaling exponent. So where will you come in contact with, uh, uh, with allometric scaling? You'll see it in PK, in PK models. Authors will say, we developed a, a allometric P PK model often they will be simply assumed as the first initial model to be an allometric scale. Uh, you'll see, also see al uh, allometry in uh, particularly when wide, range of scale, wide w ranges of sizes are considered, when people are trying to model children and adults in the same model. Uh, in that case, allometric scaling works uh, well, better than compared to other approaches. And it's also when you care about getting good model fit for extrapolation outside of your da data sets, uh, uh, generating a data, data on children and extrapolating that towards adults or the other way around. What are these assumptions? How will you recognize these assumptions? The assumptions that, that are made in the, in the PK world are that volumes uh, uh, scale linearly with size and clearances uh, in, in uh, uh, volumes per minute they'll scale to the, the, the power 0 0.75, the three-quarter power. You're, of course, thinking, where do these assumptions come from? So the response is, uh, they come from all allometric scaling laws. Now, that sounds reasonable to assume something, but then the question is, wait, why are we assuming something that it's a law? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we be trying to prove the law instead of just assuming it? So using the, the law, the word of a law for something you've assumed in your work generally gets people's attention. So let's do ourselves, we'll make an, an allometric scaling law. We'll make a very simple allometric scaling law, something that we can understand. A sphere, radius r, that makes some assumptions about this sphere, that it has a smooth surface and that's homogeneous. Now you can uh, make some calculations, the standard formulas, this is all high school math, you should be able to follow this fairly easily. Volumes are <laughs> constant times r to the cubes, uh, radius is some constant times mass to the uh, one-third, surface areas are some constant times mass to the two-thirds, 
uh, reduce everything to k as a sort of variable constant because you're mostly interested in the scaling exponent. So the way you interpret this in an allometric scaling sense is to say, for example, for surface area, surface area scales to mass to the two-thirds power. So uh, there are not many characteristics you can think of for a sphere, volume, radius, the surface area. Um, uh, radius to the one-third power, uh, surface area to the two-thirds power. The thing to recognize is that these exponents are universal. And this is sort of a touchy word again. It's universal. It, in what I mean in that sense is they apply, these exponents apply to every sphere in the universe, given the assumptions. Um, and the validity of the assumptions rests on the validity of the assumptions. Uh, the validity of the exponents rests on the validity of the assumptions, and of course the math. If you do the math wrong, you might get the wrong uh, exponent. And the thing to realize here, I want to emphasize, is we're not going to discuss whether these are correct formulas or not. This is given. We don't. We're not going to. We're not going to describe whether. We're not going to have a our disagreement about whether surface area. To, uh, uh, scales to mass of the two-thirds in this context. It's too simple. Everyone will agree with this. If data, if we find data which doesn't ex uh, match this scaling law, then there's something wrong with the data, or m possibly there's something wrong with the validity assumptions for where the, how that data was generated. And the other thing that's not often mentioned in this context is it's important to realize that these exponents are bound together via the structural assumptions. You're not free to estimate a, a, a different uh, exponent for radius and leave all the other uh, uh, exponents th unchanged. There's a, there's a structural assumption and uh, when, if one of the exponents changes, you're changing the basis, basic assumptions and then it's, there's a possibility that all of the uh, exponents can change. And this is the important uh, uh, step by West, who had made the, probably the most important allometric scaling uh, uh, article in, in many years. He made uh, more complex assumptions. Uh, he talked about space-filling hierarchical branching networks. Often they're described as fractals, but it's not really fractals, because uh, fractals are endless, uh, and uh, uh, the assumption of West was about invariance of the terminal branches. The terminal branches of some th that distribution network are the same size, irrespective of the size of the biological entity. And he also assumed that the energy required to distribute resources across this network uh, would be minimized. That it has to be an efficient system. Now, when you work out this math in the exact same manner that I did that for the spheres, Many of these characteristics scale to power multiples of one quarter. So they're often referred to as quarter, quarter law scaling, uh, uh, quarter power scaling laws. Uh, volume scales to mass to the first power. Time uh, uh, scales to mass to the quarter power. Power scales to mass to the three quarters power. And rate is scales to mass to the minus one quarter power. Here is, should be very obvious that the exponents for time and for exponents for rate are very clearly linked. Any time, time intervals can be expressed as a rate. So the, those exponents that you are not free to, to mix and match exponents, They're, it's fixed in the structural uh, assumptions. So um, I don't know if you can read this. These, uh, because the, the structures which uh, talked about by West are much more complex than just a simple sphere, you get a whole bunch of different interesting and relevant uh, characteristics, and you can calculate their uh, ec uh, scaling exponents. Uh, probably uh, you see, let me see, cardiac output scaling to the three quarter power, uh, circulation time scaling to the 0 0.25 or one quarter power. So the important thing to recognize here is the theory of West, the model of West, the structure described by West binds all these properties via uh, 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 the, all these exponents are bound via the, the structures which uh, described by West. So how do you take that what West has talked about and how do you apply that, how is that applied in PK? Well, West talked about 
uh, or in, in, in pharmacokinetics, you talk about compartments. So the way you would directly do that would take, do, do assume of some volume, some pharmacokinetic volume, would be a reference volume times a compartmental weight divided by a reference weight, scaled to the, no, I didn't write it down, but it should be a one power there, and clearance as a clearance, reference clearance times compartment weight divided by reference weight to the th three quarter power. But we don't know the compartment weights. But if we assume that the weight of each compartment grows isometrically with total weight, then the compartmental weight to compartment reference is the exact same number as the weight divided by the reference weight. So uh, for a 70 kilogram reference, some, uh, that should be a weight ref should be 70 kilos. Size is weight over 70 kilos. Volumes are a reference volume times that size. Clearances uh, are a, 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 a reference clearance times size to the three quarter power. Um, the next step is multi-compartmental models. How do you extend these to multi-compartmental models? The obvious extension is to just make the same assumptions for all compartments that they grow isometrically with weight. They grow as some kind of some constant percentage. Then the volume scale, uh, all the volumes for, here's an example of a three compartmental model, all the volume scale to the size to the first power, clearance scaling and clearance and the intercompartmental clearances scaling to size to the three quarter power. Another approach, which is a little different way of looking at it, is to realize that volume grows proportional to compartment weight. And you, we can use these as estimates for uh, Q2 and Q3. So the uh, formulas, uh, instead of uh, equating uh, Q2 via the, the, the size of the, the organism to as total, uh, you can equate it to uh, Q2 reference divide, uh, times the volume divided by the reference volume to the three-quarter power, and, and similarly for Q3. Um, as written, these are exactly the same numerically identical functions. So you say, why would you choose, they're not, if they're not different, why would you choose one expression or the other? The difference is, is when you include uh, uh, inter-individual variability, they become different. And the second interpretation has been shown to uh, uh, improve model fit for propofol in our general purpose model we published in uh, 2014. And it's also been shown for the advant advantageous for remifentanil, which has uh, been accepted for publication in uh, anesthesiology, but hasn't, hasn't appeared in the journal yet. So that's allometric scaling and how it's applied to uh, pharmacokinetic kinetic models. Well, let's talk about the real problems with allometric scaling. You might not believe it. What are the what are the what are the holes in the theory? Well, one of the one of the fundamental things about the assumption of West is the equivalence between size and weight. In West, the entire volume of the organism takes part of resource distribution. But that's not true in pharmacokinetics. Drugs partition themselves in different tissues differently. And it, it is sometimes a little bit hard to get your, your head around the idea that the size of a person, the size of an individual, depends on the drug that's being given to that individual and how it partitions within that individual. So it's not the size of the individual, it's the size of the individual and the drug together. That's a little bit, sometimes a little bit hard to, to, get, to get your head around. As long as everything remains proportional, the theory holds exactly as, the, as the, the formulas I've already given. But the whole point of it, in the beginning, uh, we were looking at the, the skeletons of the elephant and the cat. The whole point was, things aren't linear. The skeletons, the body composition, how much Part of how, what percentage of the body uh, is skeleton between an elephant and a cat are not the same, and it's not linear. So that's the, the, the disconnect between size and weight. There's, there, we don't have any better way yet to describe size than using weight right now, but it's, it's, it is problematic in the theory. And we don't know a priori what size descriptor might be best for, for some drugs. Uh, size, might, size might be best weight, might be fat-free mass, it might be something else. We don't know a priori uh, whether the different compartments might be, represent different tissues, and which would also scale differently with size across body sizes. And probably the, the biggest problem with allometric scaling is its falsification is quite difficult. In real data sets, if weight range is gonna be wide, where allometric scaling makes a big difference, a visible difference, the age range, is going, age range is probably going to be as wide as well, and variability in, in body composition is going to be as wide as well. 
This ma it makes it difficult to disprove the appropriateness of applying allometric scaling to real data. Age and body composition and, m and maturation, for example, they're confounders. They will be collinear with weight. Uh, and um, that makes it very difficult to separate the influence of these effects. And that makes it hard to falsify allometric scaling. And that's a, a definite shortcoming in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the theory. And hypothesis testing is more difficult than just estimating exponents. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit later in this presentation. The other thing that makes it sometimes difficult to talk about allometric scaling is that modern language, just the way we talk to each other about size, is unnatural uh, when, you, when you try and look at the math of how the West describes size. We talk about allometric scaling collects for, corrects for size. You, people automatically think, oh, so it works very good for large obese people. Well, obesity is body composition, but yeah, sort of. Oh, does, does it work for very small children? Well, small children might be I immature. So that's a language issue that's sometimes a little bit more difficult than you'd s think superficially. There are some non-problems with allometric scaling. These are things that, that some people uh, describe as a problem with allometric scaling, but it's not, not really a problem. Allometric scaling does not address, address age. Nothing what, what West described deals with aging. So things that influence, when, if age influences a um, uh, characteristic, of, characteristic of interest, um, allometric scaling is not gonna, might not work there, e ideally. The same thing applies to obese individuals. If body composition across some range uh, deviates considerably, then the, equ the, the equating weight and size might be problematic. Allometric scaling, in, in this, in, for a similar reason, might not work for young, <laughs> immature individuals. If maturation of an organ is not complete, then size is not the primary, primary determinant of, that function, of that, uh, uh, the function of that organ. Um, and allometric scaling does not deal with that at all. Nothing what West talked about is ab about maturation. Now, typically, maturation functions d uh, diminish uh, uh, when, they're, when they're needed for correcting for allometric scaling. Typically, they diminish between two and five years. Allometric scaling obviously does not address anything about disease. So getting uh, data sets with, uh, with various diseases and trying to disprove or prove allometric scaling is, is not, often not possible. And because so many published allometric models scale everything to weight, uh, some people seem to think that that's what an allometric model is, that it only corrects for weight. And often when uh, uh, modeled, which is only correcting for weight, uh, even though age changes, even though maturation changes, those models sometimes work poorly. And often this is attributed to, well, so an allometric model doesn't work properly. But in reality, it's, it's an unwisely constructed model because you're conflating age and maturation and uh, uh, other things into what should be, uh, what is a theory only about size. So there's a recent editorial um, in Anesthesia and Analgesia, which had a very, nice, a very nice quote, which I thought was very typical and understanding about, about how people experience this. Almost no data support the suggestion that human ph pharmacokinetics models scale better to weight to the three-quarter power than weight to body surface area or other common metrics. And the, the focus of the editorial was on a simulation, uh, was uh, dexa, dexametatomidina pharmacokinetics in children. And on the left is a simulation from the editorial itself, and on the right is a sim my simulation of the simulation. And basically this is uh, uh, it random individuals uh, simulated using the clearances, giving the typical values and the variabilities uh, described by Sue et al. in, in the children dexametatomidina pharmacokinetics. So the point here was the straight line is the linear model, the dotted line is the allometric model. There's no difference. There's no important difference for this data set. So why would you choose to use an allometric model? If everyone's comfortable with a linear model, why, why, would, why is an allometric model better? Why would you choose that? And for this data, in this limited context, that's a completely reasonable uh, statement. But what I want to do is look a little bit wider. Let's expand this to include adult da uh, data, uh, adult uh, weight ranges. Now, when you start looking at expanded scale, 
the linear and the, um, and the allometric model start predicting very differently. And just for, my, for myself to get an impression how this works, I did the same kind of simulation with uh, dexmedetomidina uh, pharmacokinetics from Hannyford, uh, uh, the, the dexmedetomidina in adults. And the dots are then simulated individuals from this, this, with the same uh, uh, variabilities and typical values for adults. And you see this matches much better the allometric model than the linear model. Um, so you could say, well, why use the power model at all? We could just cut everything up into little portions. We have a children's model, we have an adult's model, we have an, uh, 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 an obese model. Um, this, this requires people who use these models to remember which model they need to use, and that adds a risk of getting things wrong. The other aspect is when these models are all developed separately, at the, they won't, very often they won't match at boundaries. Taking a, a pediatric model and ex extrapolating it up to 18 years old is probably not going to give you the same number as an adult model extrapolated down to 18 years old. And that means, as a total, uh, the models together suggest that some person makes some discontinuous jump in their clearance or volumes on their 18th birthday or on when their BMI exceeds 30. This, is, this doesn't make sense. The advantage of the allometric model is that it solves these problems without induce, it doesn't in, induce, introduce any additional model parameters. So the complexity of the model is the same. And a lot of research, even the most ones critical about allometric scaling, suggest that the, the 0.75 factor works acceptably for ages greater than five years, which is kind of what you expect. You expect maturation to play more a role in the younger children. I like to say good extrapolation properties are like anti-lock brakes on a car. Ideally, you don't want to use them, but when you need them, it's good to have them there. So uh, a lot of research, there's a lot of uh, publications about estimating the scaling exponent. A lot of people want to take data sets and estimating the scaling exponent to check whether 0 0.75 is in the confidence region and say allometric scaling works for my data set or it doesn't work for my data set. I've disproven it, 0 0.75 is outside my confidence region. Now, I'm just, for just for now, I'm just going to ignore the fact that the exponents for all these different characteristics are really bound together. You can't really estimate one separately from the rest without making, uh, without implying structural changes which are unspecified. Let's just forget that for now, and let's just talk about estimating scaling exponents. It's easy to do mathematically, but it's harder to get it, harder to get it right than you think. This is a very simple, straightforward clearance model. Now, add a little bit of noise to that, 15% noise. And then I'm going to use uh, the nonlinear least squares function in R to estimate the reference value and the exponent. I'm going to do that a thousand times. And you can make a little histogram of all the exponents I found. Well, the exponents are nicely uh, uh, centered around the, the, the theoretical value which I put in the data. So everyth everything is good and fine in the world. But let's, let's take 15% noise and let's add it to the x-axis. This corresponds to weight not being the same thing as size. We're going to regress on a different value than the actual true value. Now this is 15% of noise, so you plot the data again. Now you see it's a little bit more noisier, but it's not really fundamentally different than what we just, what have you just seen. Except when you try to estimate the exponent, it's biased. So the thing we put in, the 0 0.75, and we've only added normal noise to everything, now we're not estimating the, the exponent right. And maybe somebody is going to make some wrong conclusions. This data does not support 0 0.75 when it was simulated to have 7, 0 0.75. The same occurs with things that are correlated with size. For example, I made a, an age value which is correlated with weight. I made a, 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 a fairly light correlation with clearance. And now I'm just going to ignore the age. And I'm going to fit just the scaling exponent. And you see that the estimated exponents are, are quite a bit lower than the theoretical value which I put in. And you would be excused, it would be quite reasonable to say, well, it looks like this data supports 
surface area scaling, uh, an exponent of 0 0.6, instead of the true value, which is 0 .0 0 0.75, which we simulated in the first place. So you can uh, uh, no notice that we would have falsely rejected the theoretical scaling. And there are a number of public publications which do this exact same thing. They ignore the influence of age, they ignore the influence of maturation or, or body composition on the parameter of interest, and, and pretend weight predicts everything through an uh, allometric exponent. And they find uh, that, that uh, 0 0.75 doesn't, do their, uh, doesn't predict their data very well, and that this is thus a problem for allometric scaling. It's not really. Um, uh, so some research will pretty much straightforwardly claim there is no universal scaling exponent, but this is now a language issue. There is a universal scaling exponent. We, uh, uh, we put it in the, uh, uh, it's, it's mathematical. It doesn't even rely on data. Um, what they mean is that the conditions of testing violate the assumptions. Of course, of course that's true. All models are wrong. But some are useful. What we're missing is a, as an explanation of how we can improve the model of West to agree with data. We should be trying to fix or improve the structure described by West and not discard it. If I can give you some take-home messages, uh, theoretical allometric scaling exponents ba are based on a mathematical relationship based on structural assumptions. The theory does not rely on data. That's a little bit weird thing to say you know, before a whole bunch of, of data-driven people, but it's just a mathematical re relationship. If data doesn't support that theory, then the assumptions don't hold. We should be f we, what we should be doing is trying to improve and refine these, these theories instead of discarding allometric scaling as a whole. It doesn't work for my data because I find 0 0.6 fits, fits my data best. Allometri allometry is based on size. Weight is not, not the same thing as size, but it's the best we can do. Uh, you can go on Wikipedia and look at the weight, find the weight of a mouse and the weight of an elephant and the weight of a blue whale but I can't find the fat-free mass of a mouse and the fat-free mass of an elephant and the fat-free mass of a blue whale. So even if things scale to fat-free mass, I don't have that information to try that. Allometry has nothing to do with age or maturation or body composition. And estimating the allometric exponents in a simple way, pretending that weight is everything, can lead to false rejection of the true uh, theoret uh, theoret theoretical value of 0.75. Uh, that's my whole talk. Thank you very much.